Hello and welcome to today's TOC podcast. I'm Joe Weikert, co-chair of O'Reilly's Tools of Change Conference. I'd like to remind you that you can keep up on all upcoming TOC events, including webcasts and podcasts, by visiting the conference website, tocon.com. TOC Frankfurt is the next in-person event on the schedule, and it's less than a month away. This year features not only the full-day TOC event on Tuesday, October 11th, but also a half-day social media workshop on Thursday the 13th. For more information or to register, visit tocfrankfurt.com. As I mentioned during an earlier TOC podcast with Max Franke from Germany, one of our goals is to provide you with a global perspective on publishing, focusing on the growth of e-content. With that in mind, for today's podcast, I'm joined by Javier Salea, CEO of Dos Doce Digital Culture in Madrid, Spain. Javier, welcome to this TOC podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me. So, Javier, let's let's start off with ebooks. How's the ebook market in Spain looking these days? Well, things are moving up. Uh, I always say that Spain is a country that goes from the past to the present to the future without going through the present, and this has happened once again here with the ebooks. If you ask me this question like a year ago, year and a half ago, most likely I will say, well, call me in a year or so. Uh, you are asking the question at the right time. Things are moving. Uh, the sector is taking ebooks very seriously, and international players like Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Apple and you know the big players are all looking at this market. Oh, good. Good to know. So, is there a significant difference between the demand for Spanish language ebooks and and English language ones in Spain? Well, I think everyone is looking at this country not only because of what Spain represents. That is a market of about 47 million Spaniards that live in this country and consume Spanish content, Spanish books. Uh, they look in our market because we have we represent a potential market of 500 million uh, Spanish-speaking people worldwide. Uh, most of the big publishers that export that content are based in this country. There are local players in every one of the Latin American countries, but the big, big players based in Madrid, based in Barcelona, that export quite a lot of content to those markets. So that's why all these big international players are taking a closer look at the potential of the Spanish market in the digital race. In regards to the internal demand, uh, yes, there is a demand for ebooks, although today it's, it's quite minimal. It's, I'm, you know, many times I say that today we are about two, three years ago where you were uh, at the initial race uh, of the digital race. Uh, it's about 3% of the total sales in this country is, uh, is related to digital goods. But things are moving very fast. There are some publishers who are already claiming they have up to 5%. And with the arrival of all the international players, I think that will increase, increase up to 10% next year. Hmm, okay, that's impressive. So, and and you know, one of the biases that we saw here in the states was just this really strong preference towards print books and a resistance to e-books. Are you seeing the same situation in Spain, or is that loosening up a bit? As I said uh, before, uh, I think uh, we have seen in the last, uh, I think, twelve, eighteen months, a really radical change in the mindset of publishers. There were publishers that they were thinking that this transformation will take more years. That yes, you know, it was happening in the U.S., yes, it was happening in the U.K., that the Spaniards, uh, you know, will be much more reluctant to give up, you know, the physical books. Uh, as I said, transformations in this country, you know, uh, from that reluctance to the acceptance of the reality, it goes from one day to the other, you know, from black to white. And we've seen that at the end of last year and beginning of this year. I think publishers have realized that this is a reality, that society is changing very fast, that they use in, I don't know, like social media to, you know, update themselves about any kind of news and share information. And it's happening also to the book industry, that there's a lot of people who are reading on the screens, all kinds of screens, you know, computers, mobiles, tablets, you know, uh, uh, ink, uh, dedicated devices. So suddenly, I think the sector have realized that there is a market potential, that they have to meet that demand, and they take an action. Uh, some claim that they've been too slow, other claims, uh, that you know it was not the right time to do it and now supposedly is, is the right time to do it but I think everyone has realized that both uh, products physical goods as well as digital goods will live together in this market as well as in other markets for many years and we'll have a gradual transition from physical books to digital books although I suspect it's going to be faster that transition uh, than someone you know claims. Yeah, and you, you talked a little bit about mobile devices there, and if I if I remember right, when we spoke before, you mentioned that Spain has a really high percentage of residents with mobile devices. Is that right? Yeah, that's very true. This is a country in which we have more mobile devices than citizens. 
The last statistics from the Ministry of Industry, I think they declare we had about 57 million uh, devices in this country, where, as I said before, we only have 47 million people living in it. Uh, there's basically 10 million people with a double anxiety with two devices, you know, maybe one for work, maybe one for personal use. Uh, uh, we take technology very fast and basically, you know, uh, turn it into a day-to-day -day tool for any kind of purpose. Uh, I think mobile devices in this country will become the tool to search for books, to buy books, and maybe some people will read it on those books, on those devices, on mobile devices. But most likely, I foresee that people will use the mobile devices to search for books, to decide which book compared to others, depending on any comments they get from social networking, and then purchase but read it on, on, a, on a device, or on the screen, or on a tablet. Okay, makes sense. So, you know, I keep pointing back to May of 2010 here in the United States because that seemed to be a real turning point for us uh, where ebook adoption really went through the roof. And I, and I attribute that to three different things happening, but kind of related. One, Barnes & Noble reduced the price of their Nook reader, which then kind of forced Amazon to lower the price on the Kindle. And then just at the same time in, in May of last year, Apple re released the uh, initial iPad. So those three things together, I think, really built up a nice installed base of readers there. Do you see the market forces aligning like this at all in Spain anytime soon and, and resulting in a, in a huge surge in ebook sales? Well, uh, already Amazon has announced they're coming to town uh, this month in September, and I think that will spark uh, a, a new uh, era in the digital race in the Spanish markets, not only because, you know, who is Amazon and the way it takes seriously a market wants, you know, it decides to, to, to penetrate it, but also because, you know, Kindle supposedly is also arriving in Spain for Christmas, and supposedly as well with, uh, you know, the new tablet that, you know, Amazon has announced they will put on the market. Uh, in terms of readers, uh, unfortunately in this country compared to other European countries as well as to the U.S., we don't have a very large uh, reader base. Uh, every time the National Association, you know, does a survey, uh, uh, to find out how many Spaniards read a, a book, 50%, uh, half of it, said openly they do not read a book. Uh, so that's 50% of the market, you know, is, is, is not commercial available for, for this kind of products. Therefore, I think, you know, e-ink devices, which basically heavy readers, you know, the people who, who read a lot and they see, you know, a benefit in reading on those kind of devices, I don't think they will have a large market. Whereas tablets, which, you know, are, in my belief, a device that helps people to read their news, uh, read blogs, uh, listen to music, watch TV series, and read books, will become, I think, the device of choice. And tablets already in Spain are big. You've seen, you know, not only the iPad, but you see Samsung, you see, you know, many other players like Dell, you know, doing a huge commercial effort in this country to sell tablets. Once we have the Kindle tablet and once we have, you know, new versions of other places with the tablets, I think we'll see a, a strong growth of ebook demand because more devices on any market in this country uh, in purpose means more demand because those devices, as you know, are given uh, empty. Do you, you buy an iPad or you buy any other device and they're empty. And the first thing you do is you connect it to the internet and you start looking for content. So this will force publishers to put their content on the web at a very competitive price and a very easy one-click uh, e-buying process in order to meet that demand. Because if they don't do it, then you know the users will go to sites to download uh, non-authorized or illegal content. So we'll, we'll go back to what you said at the beginning here. Spain typically jumps from the past to the future and, and kind of skips the present. So you're saying that the e-ink type devices are likely to be a, a non-player in Spain. Is that right? Well, not a non-player, but more, more minimal in terms of the market representation. I mean, we don't have, you know, those heavy readers that you have in other markets that consume, you know, three to five books a month. Uh, a person is not going to spend, you know, 100 or 200 uh, euros uh, for an e-ink device that only, you know, allows you to read books or, you know, some magazines. I think people will spend that money to buy a tablet that I will allow them to combine, you know, not only reading books and magazines, but also reading books, magazines, listening to music, watching videos and the whole deal. 
Uh, I think the profile of the readers that we have in this country, you know, most of the readers in this country are, are readers that read, you know, two, three, four books a year. Basically, during Christmas and during summertime, they have free time and they basically read, you know, the top 10, you know, bestsellers. Um, and, you know, people question their, you know, their uh, reading quality. I never question them because they make it quite a big chunk of the market and they're more than welcome. You know, I always say that if they start reading those kinds of books, you know, maybe they open up their mind and read further, to, you know, uh, books uh, down the line in their lives. But those people, I suspect, are going to become more tablet readers than uh, e-ink device readers just because of economics. And you know what? I would have I would have agreed with that even happening here in the United States a year ago because I was a loyal Kindle fan, and then I got my iPad on day one, and I put my Kindle away. But earlier this year, I kind of rediscovered my love for, um, I guess, the e-ink reader and just the lightweight nature of it and how easy it is on the eyes and so forth. And the one thing I wonder about, of course, everybody keeps speculating that Amazon and maybe others will come up with a model where the, the device is, is very low priced, if not free. Do you think that could change the situation? In other words, if, if all of a sudden Spain had uh, a device out there that was uh, less than 100 euros, let's say, um, and it was e-ink based, would more people warm up to it? Or do you think it's still going to be a tablet dominated world? I think it was still a, to a tablet dominated, but there's no doubt it will, you know, foment and foster a demand that, you know, the obstacle out of a 200 pre-investment uh, to get, you know, that reading uh, enjoyment experience, if it's lower, you know, that entry to, to, to the market is lower to 100 euros, or I, I will believe it will be a very, uh, you know, smart strategic move for some publishers that will, will like to have, you know, direct contact with, you know, their readers to say, okay, I gave you for free, you know, an, an, an ink device, and you're committed to buy, you know, six, 10, 12 books, you know, a year. And that way uh, uh, I will, you know, through my pipeline along the year, will provide you with the content that you can read on this device, as well as you can read any other publishers, you know, uh, content in it. And, and I think, you know, that could be a very smart strategic move. But nevertheless, due to this nature of uh, reader and behavior in this country, I suspect that tablets will have a much larger quota and e-books, uh, dedicated e-books uh, devices will have a quota, but it will not be that large. Okay, got it. So we've talked a little bit about Amazon and Kindle and, and this rumored tablet that's supposed to come out anytime soon here. Amazon clearly is the, uh, you know, the, the big monster that we have to deal with here in the States. They're the largest player out there. Do you anticipate that they're going to have the majority of the ebook uh, device market share in Spain as well? Or are there other challenges you think that are um, going to really give them a, a run for the money? Well, it's, it's not going to happen overnight. They, as I said before, they already announced they're coming to town this month, and uh, it's going to disrupt the, the whole market. And, and already, you know, publishers as well as booksellers, they knew, you know, Amazon was coming. Everyone was suspecting it was going to be before the summer, but now it's for, you know, uh, they, they announced that it's going to be now in September. Uh, it's going to take them a while to become a big player. I mean, I, I think they will have to come into the market, understand this market, uh, and also get the trust of all, all the publishers so they have all the content available uh, in, in the Spanish market to be able to be offered in their platform. But I think Amazon uh, has some competitive advantage that is going to make their presence uh, uh, quite a, a, a very interesting uh, player. Uh, as you know, Amazon has you know more than 15 years of experience in e-commerce. And in this country, we have a law that is a fixed price law, okay? No retailer can fix, uh, change the fixed price in order to compete in the market. Uh, Amazon uses in the U.S. until the agency model uh, scenario. You use pricing as, as one of their competitive uh, uh, tools in order to get market quota. Uh, in this country, as well as other European countries like in France, uh, they're not going to be able to use that. But I think that will play in their favor. Uh, because if the product, if all books are priced the same in all points of sale, if all retailers have to offer the same book at the same price, the only difference for the user is going to be service. And service is going to be the key difference there. And I think Amazon has, as I said, you know, a lot of years of experience in service. And in this country, unfortunately, we don't have that mentality in corporations for having a focus on the end user and providing service. That said, I mean, 
publishers as well as booksellers are not going to let Amazon to get into this market and, you know, have it, you know, for free. They're going to fight for it. And, and there are strong local players like, you know, Casa del Libro, which will be, you know, similar in size uh, 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 in Spain, like um, uh, Barça Novo or, you know, El Corte Inglés, which basically is like a, a department store like Macy's with a lot of presence in all the main cities of this country with a strong bookstore chain. I mean, they're going to fight for it, but they are going to have to invest a lot in their e-commerce platform. And also they will have to invest a lot in services. And also, and this is, you know, it applies to publishers as well as to uh, booksellers. They're going to have to understand the end user uh, profiles, mentality, behaviors, needs. They're really going to have to change their strategy and start having a customer-centric, customer-oriented um, uh, go-to-market strategy. And that, as you know, in any company, especially big companies, that takes a while to do. And Amazon has that competitive advantage. They already have the mentality. They have the technology to do it. And I think they have seen this potential in this market uh, in which uh, e-commerce today is still very minimal in all uh, 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 um, activities, not only in books, but also textile or music. And But there's a huge growth growth potential. And I think Amazon has come into 10 at the right time in terms of providing a platform with content and services in a market that has a huge growth potential. So, they, so Amazon uh, certainly has some momentum that they could leverage in Spain. And they're uh, just around the corner and in, in getting there. But what about uh, Apple and the combination of the iPad and the iBookstore? Do you expect that to be pretty strong in Spain going forward as well? Well, I think the iBookstore hasn't been really a realistic player uh, in the U.S., so I don't expect it to be here as well in Spain. Uh, nevertheless, the iPad uh, has been a strong player in terms of selling book applications. Uh, and, so, uh, and I think we'll see a growth of Spanish content in iPad and the App Store, and maybe if if they you know Apple turns around you know their strategy in the iBook Store and and really becomes another competitive point of sale, you know that yes it will come. Uh, uh, I think Apple uh, still has not focused yet the Spanish market as a priority market, such as what you know Barnes and Noble and Amazon have done. Uh, but I think. Uh, Soon they will discover that once you consolidate the U.S. and the English-speaking markets, which, you know, the growth rates that, you know, I, I have seen in the last months in your markets means that, you know, basically all the cards have been, you know, spread out and uh, there's still going to be some fights. But, you know, the players are already in place and, and, and uh, the battle, you know, over there is quite consolidated. I think... The growth potential of, of these companies, the Apples, the Amazons, the Barca Novels, and the others, is in the international markets. Uh, and I think they're looking into Spain, they're looking into Germany, they're looking into China, they're looking into this language-based market in which there's a huge growth potential that complements their natural markets. There's a lot of people in this country uh, that uh, have English as their second language. And when they go into a platform like Amazon, they probably have an intention to buy Spanish content, but they will probably put in their basket some English content as well, because they will see the advantage of doing cross purchase. Uh, they will buy maybe a movie in English and a book in Spanish or, you know, vice versa. And I think that potential of cross selling content in different languages uh, will make, you know, another gross revenue for these companies. Okay, let's let's shift gears for a minute and talk for a moment about uh, DRM. And as I'm sure you're aware, O'Reilly is an advocate for a DRM-free industry. What, what's your opinion of DRM, and what's the future of DRM in Spain? Well, I'm I'm also a, a person who uh, uh, promotes non-DRM uh, uh, books uh, because in 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 two purposes and two, and two uh, rationales. And the first one is uh, when you purchase a product that has DRM it makes the whole purchase process very annoying for the end user. And also once you buy that product, it also creates many obstacles when you consume that product in different devices. Nevertheless, I understand publishers and agents, let's not forget the agents that many times tell the writers not to give the rights to publishers without DRM because they fear that if it goes unprotected, 
you know, it will be pirate or copy unauthorized. We all know that DRMs basically protect nothing. If you want to break that lock, the DRM lock, you can do it in seconds. So in my view, I think technology has to evolve and provide a solution of a DRM scenario in which the user doesn't see it. And, and we've seen it in, in, in Kindle and we've seen it in Apple in which they have their own embedded DRMs. But when you buy a product on those platforms, you don't see it. I mean, from the end user point of view, there is no obstacle in the way you purchase the, the, the article and the way you consume it. Initially in this country, uh, most, I will say, you know, 98% of the publishers uh, have, you know, uh, commercialized their products with DRM. I have started seeing a change of mindset. Uh, there are some publishers, even big publishers, that are putting, you know, parts of their catalogs without DRM. And basically it's because their authors are telling their editors, their publishers, I would like my product to go to market without DRM. My books, which are published by Grupo Planeta, which is one of the biggest publishers in this country, are published without DRM. So I think we will see more of that. And I also hope we'll see an evolution in technology that allows both parties, the user as well as the seller, to have some guarantees that if there is anyone trying to have you know, an authorized, unauthorized use of that content, it's not, you know, make it that easy. Yeah, so let's let's hope that DRM is a short-term solution for everybody and that it's going away quickly. I'm right with you on that. So last area I wanted to talk to you about is direct sales. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't suggest for a moment that retailers are going away. I think that their role is evolving just like publishers' roles are evolving. Um, and I think it's really important for publishers to establish a really strong direct sales channel. Are you seeing publishers in Spain who are following that uh, approach? And, uh, and is it with ebooks as well as print books or one or the other? I think we'll also see that change of mindset in this country, and we've already seen it. I was reading before I joined this podcast, uh, Pearson in Spain has created their direct-to-market ebooks channel, and, and I think we'll see more of that. We will see more companies uh, deciding that I think is the right time to have a direct contact with your end user, uh, not only because of the, a lot of people, when you talk about direct sales, uh, you know, they first think about this and and, and, it, and it was very good that you make it very clear from the beginning that this doesn't imply that you're not going to sell through retailers. You know, one doesn't exclude the other, but I think it complements both channels very nicely. Uh, I think digital allows publishers to sell direct, not only because of the cost involved on the margin safe that of course you know that is always welcome okay but because of the knowledge you're going to have about the market you're going to be able to have a direct relationship with your end user you're going to know who that person is but not only the name and the location and the credit card which of course are important information but more about their behavior you know which are the days of the week and the times of the week they come into the platform which books they suffer, which books they touch but they don't buy, which book they save on you know, the wish list, which books they buy. And then you have technology that also analyzes the consumption of the books they have purchased. You will know if they finish the book till the end, if they have underlined the book or not. And with that information, you can give service to both parties. You can give service to your writers. You can go back to your writers and say, look, we've been analyzing your book. And we can tell you, we don't know why, but people jump from page 17 to page 25 and there's something in there that people, you know, get bored or whatever, you repeat yourself. Or we have seen that a lot of people, especially in technical books, they go directly into, you know, the whatever, the Twitter chapter and they dedicate a lot of time into that content. Also, with that information, they can go back to the end users because they will have information about what kind of books are really consumed? What kind of books are being recommended? What kind of books are being, you know, given as a gift or whatever? And I think publishers will make market decisions with much more information, real information, because in the analog world that we live today, they get that information, but they get it through third parties. You know, retailers give that information, but it's basically aggregated information. They have no way of really knowing, you know, who is behind that data. And I think in the 21st century, one of the main competitive advantage of any publisher is going to, is going to be managing 
metadata. Metadata about the content they sell and metadata about how that content is being consumed in different devices, in different locations, in different time zones. And with that information, I think you can make very smart business decisions. And maybe depending on the type of publisher that you are, maybe selling direct only represents 10% of your total sales. If that's only the size of your direct sales, it could be like a small survey of the total. Other publishers might have 50% or up to 60%, you know, and you know that will change their whole business strategy. If, if a publisher finds out that they're able to sell up to 50% of their products directly to the market, I mean, they're going to have to redraft the whole business and commercial strategy, marketing strategy. So I think we will see more publishers in Spain undertaking direct sales efforts just to test the market in terms of the potential, you know, the size of the market, as well as what business decisions I have to take in the next five years to be able to guarantee that I still become uh, our, you know, the leader in this market. Yeah, I think you brought up just a really good point that's often overlooked in the whole direct sales space. And that is when we talk about it, we get you know excited to think, oh, okay, yeah, we can capture all the transaction without having to share it with a middleman, if you will, right? But but that's just part of the benefit, and and maybe even a bigger part of the benefit here is, like you said, having having that direct relationship, but being able to capture the data that comes with it as well, and then that's only step one in my mind because what you've got to do is act on that data, right? So what's it going to cause you to do? How are you going to learn from it? How are you going to change your behaviors and so forth? And you're absolutely right. That's that's a huge part of of the direct sales opportunity going forward so couldn't agree more mm -hmm. no I, and I really and it's gonna you know it's gonna take a little time for publishers to understand that there is a shift in their business model not only content but service around the content because uh, there's gonna be a lot of content out there in the web you know there's gonna be free content there's gonna be pirate content there's gonna be uh, you know self editing content so why someone is gonna buy your content at a cost they're gonna buy that content because, of course, it's good. We, you know, we're gonna always assume that the content you're selling as a publisher is the best content available on the market. But because of the service around that content, and those service around the content will be determined by the behavior of your client base around previous content, and that's gonna be your competitive advantage: content plus services. Right, right. Very insightful. Well, Javier Salaya, thank you so much for joining us for today's TOC podcast. I really appreciate it. 